Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you to the panel on investing in African critical minerals in a competitive environment. Jude, you can start us off with an overview of the current investment landscape for critical minerals in Africa. What factors are shaping investor interest and what challenges are most pressing in today's market? Thank you. I'm not sure why you picked on me first. But, uh, <laughs> You've I'm been here before. <laughs> yeah. So a number of things are shaping uh, investor interest in, uh, in critical minerals, most of it external uh, to those investors. Uh, they are all aware of the growing importance of critical minerals to industry, uh, to national, respective national security, uh, and uh, to also the opportunity for a growth industry. So there are a number of uh, companies uh, across the globe, and especially in the U.S. where I am, um, who want to understand hopefully what we're going to disclose and discuss today, and that is what is the process of uh, expressing your interest in, uh, in developing uh, and or acquiring uh, critical mineral uh, commodities, uh, where is the financing for those types of projects, uh, and what are the prospects for you know, that being a uh, sustainable um, uh, investment. I think that uh, we're going to, in the, in the process of uh, our discussions today, we'll discuss some of the, some of the things that, for instance, my bank, uh, Exim Bank, looks at in terms of how you can qualify for funding of, um, of, uh, of Exim Bank uh, resources, and I'm sure others will discuss that as well. But I can tell you that one of the drivers internationally of uh, why a lot of people are becoming uh, interested in critical minerals, including sovereigns, is just the incredible growth and importance that other countries are beginning to place on critical minerals. The U.S. government has a very, very straightforward and quite aggressive policy of uh, creating partnerships so that we have uh, both partners and access to commodities of, uh, that are on this list of critical minerals. And so uh, others hearing that and being aware of it uh, are expressing some interest in getting involved in something that they think is going to be a growth industry and a demand interest industry. So those are some of the things that are driving, uh, I think, investor interest in this. Thank you. We've heard today that there's a lot of dominance in terms of China in South Africa. Has the U.S. Aggress aggression into coming into South Af into Africa a recent strategy, or um, I think the strategy is not recent, and uh, it's hard to sort of acknowledge that a part of this is competitive. But there is such a thing as a zero sum game. There is there is a quantity. Yeah of uh, critical minerals. And so the fact that there are um, many other regions and some large countries that are focused on these resources means that the U.S. and other countries really must, uh, you know, place their stake into the markets to try and make sure that they get their fair share of, of some, of these, uh, some of these minerals. Thank you. Moving on to Mamecha. As Africa looks to attract more investment, what policy frameworks and enabling environments are essential to support growth in critical minerals? What balance, what balance should be struck between foreign investment and local interests? Um, thank you, Kiana, for, for that question. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mean, in the first instance, we need to ask ourselves, do we actually have these resources that everybody keeps talking about? And the answer is yes. You know, we're the biggest when it comes to cobalt, in the top five when it comes to manganese. Um, so how do we actually get the right capital that works for us on, on the continent, right? Um, my, 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 how I look at this always is the dollar that we are looking for is a dollar that can go anywhere else in the world. So what makes us special? The first thing I think is let's talk about regulation. Um, we need to have the right regulatory environment that enables investors to come in. So how does that happen? Um, number one, um, mining is a long-term game. It's not like private equity where you can come in for three, five years and you exit. So investors are taking a long-term view on the country. 
that they're coming into. So they need to know to, and understand that um, it is stable and what are the rules of engagement. So that's the first step. And I think, you know, some African countries have uh, done really well. Others have uh, done well and um, along the way uh, lost their way, such as South Africa. I think we we actually at some point, you know, did not get, I mean, we're, we're not getting as many investors as we used to because our regulation was not as clear. Then the second part is, um, will I make money off this investment, right? So one, uh, we have to have the right resource. But secondly, is there the infrastructure so that you can actually extract your um, resource out of the country? And if it's not there, can I build that infrastructure to support uh, me getting the, the resource out of the country? And am I allowed to actually take the resource out of the country? Um, then once that those two are done is, can I bring in my money into the country and will I get it out? So that is really critical to, to also uh, unpack. Once, once uh, those three are, are covered, then it is more of how easy is it for me to actually start operating the, the ease of operation is such a big thing, you know, um, and if you, it, there is red tape, uh, if I cannot get the mining license, if it takes me five years to get the mining license, I, I'd rather go somewhere else where I can actually, uh, you know, get that licensing uh, to happen. Now, going, so the, those are the, I think, if I was an investor, you know, from outside looking in, those are some of the things I would look at. Now, on local partnerships, right, and this is something that I think us as, as, at Moshe Capital pride ourselves uh, with when we actually work with um, mining houses and um, other stakeholders, be it government, etc. Um, you have to find a middle ground that actually works for everyone. And everybody has to be slightly uncomfortable because not everybody, you can't get everything that you want on your tick box and the terms of, of, of engagement. So how do you do that? I think, you know, taking care of communities and employees must be a hygiene factor. I don't think we should even be here to, and talk about that. Uh, I think we need to all know that, you know, you, you have to take care of your communities within reason and you have to take care of your, of your employees. So yeah. finding that balance on what is important for the country versus what is important for the investor is really critical. Um, on what is important for the country, I think these things must be outlined upfront so that there are no surprises. As, as mentioned, you know, mining is a long-term investment, so you need to be sure that you actually understand how you're engaging and that your returns will be there um, in that period that you're invested. Thank you. So definitely the need for stable and transparent frameworks, yeah. I think. Moving on to Shirley, with the increased emphasis on ESG, what challenges and opportunities do you see for African countries aiming to meet these standards? How are financial institutions like APSA supporting sustainable investments? Look, that's a very big subject matter, as we all know these days. Um, but I think the answer is actually very simple. Um, capital will follow sustainability now going forward. And I think financial institutions, private equity investors, infrastructure funds, etc., will definitely go into projects where they see there's a concerted effort to do ESG properly. Um, you've spoken about, for example, the, the S part, the social impact. I think that's going to be very important, that we do support communities around the area where we either mine or put up projects, etc. But I think the social aspect also goes a bit further. In other words, extraction of our ore in Africa is one thing, and we should start building, you know, beneficiation or value chain activities within the boundaries of the country as well. And again, I don't think it becomes a requirement from a financial institution to do that, but there should be the ease of trying to facilitate that as well. Maybe it doesn't become 100% of beneficiation of the end product that happens within the boundaries of a country. Maybe, you know, a certain percentage before it goes somewhere else to be beneficiated any further. So um, when we look at projects, we also now, as a financial institution, are trying to do not just your usual mining projects. You know, anyone can literally, and I say to you, anyone can finance gold and platinum because 
it's known, you know what you get per ounce, and you know you can hedge it and risk manage, etc. But I think it's time for financial institutions to do what is important for the just transition. We, we know that gas, for example, becomes a transition mm -hmm. fuel. But if we are putting in money for renewable plants, Where's the magnets for the wind turbines? Where's the steel for the solar? So for us, it's those input and financing of the input into the renewables that help with the transition. That's what financial institutions should start doing. And I know it can't all be hedged. You know, and there's not a price or an exchange for, for many of mm. these products. But then we should take a view, where's it going? As off, where's the offtake going? Um, and then that becomes a discussion, even if you can't risk manage the actual commodity price specifically. So we will support Africa because that's our backyard and we will remain there. And it helps if the government policies, the regulations and everything is clear. That just helps the financial institutions in that regard. But just to come back to the ESG, um, we cannot ignore that anymore. The environment must be protected as well, and ensuring that we bring the whole environmental aspect into consideration as well. But the just transition, as much as we think it can be ignored, it's going to be there. It's how we actually help, and it's not just by putting up renewables. Thanks. Yes. Thank you, Shirley. Um, moving on to Martin, <clears throat> given your global perspective with the World Bank, what trends do you see shaping the future of critical minerals, especially in emerging markets like those in Africa? How can African nations position themselves competitively in this global landscape, particularly with respect to sustainable practice, practices and infrastructure development? Okay, thanks for the question. Look, I think uh, the other panelists have said it, that a dollar can go anywhere. You know, in other words, mining is a globally competitive business. And... Investors are ultimately always balancing a portfolio of risk and reward. If things get riskier in Latin America, you get more investment in Africa. If things get more risky in Africa, you get more investment in, in Latin America. Now, Africa has about 33% of the known global reserves. But that's not the limit because, as we know, Africa is extremely poorly explored. There is a lot more there to discover, and we don't know what the true potential is yet. This rising demand for critical minerals, I think we will get into some of the geopolitics a little bit later, but it does create one of these opportunities. One of the trends that I see in many countries, and this has been as early as two years ago, is that these countries are receiving delegations from much more foreign missions. Uh, there is a lot more sovereign interest in the the rare or special metals at many of these African countries. And it's actually quite difficult, I think, for many of these countries to react. They don't really know what to do. And even if there is a critical minerals strategy that identifies a vision, what I see is that the next level of that strategy isn't very well defined, or if it even exists in terms of tactically, what, what should you do? Look, one of the other trends I think that we see is you know, driven particularly by let's say, well-known brands. I wouldn't say every company is interested in this, but a lot of them are interested in selling responsible products, and they're looking backwards into their value chains and making sure that every process, every input, is sourced or produced as responsibly as profitable. Now, whether that means human rights issues, and we've heard about cobalt, cobalt red in the DRC, and it's very difficult for the DRC to shake that reputation at this point. Um, Decarbonization is the other key uh, trend. And with the uh, carbon border market adjustment mechanisms, or CBAM, sorry, um, carbon market adjustment mechanisms, the, uh, the products of countries that don't have an equivalent carbon policy in place end up getting taxed at, a, uh, at the destination of the consumer country. There's no repatriation of that tax to the producer country. It gets kept. So the EU's CBAM will gather, collect revenues, and not redistribute it to those countries that didn't have the tax in place. Now, the first prize, obviously, is to reduce your GHGs, become you know, 
carbon competitive and perhaps even a supplier of choice to the rest of the world, but where you can't do that because it does take time to shift the global or the national energy mix. The second prize, I, unfortunately, is to tax that yourself to an equivalent level and try and redistribute it because otherwise the ultimate effect is that the price that your producer will receive is going to be lower than someone else's or than it was before. And so you've actually transferred a part of your subsoil resource wealth to a consumer country if you're not doing things yourself. And in these, these, I think that message needs to come out a little bit more, I think, to understand the impact of it and, and so that action can take place. Look, I'll be brief, but the third trend we've been talking about quite a bit has been the desire for value addition. And I think for the first time in my career at the World Bank, I'm seeing a coalescing of support for this. African countries have wanted this forever. And we've always had this view, and everyone's had this view of laissez-faire economics, specialize in what you're good at, collect the tax revenue, distribute, invest strategically, da da da. But this, this uh, move towards industrial policy um, is a new trend. And it's happening for two reasons. One, because it's good for these producing countries to create these jobs, to gather that income, the foreign exchange. But two, I think there's this recognition, let's say among G7 Western countries, that they can't do this on their own. I mean, first prize for them is to secure all the minerals they need within their sovereign territory and have the whole value chains on, on short. That's not going to happen, not anytime soon. The second prize is to um, have partnerships with like-minded like friends, I think is the word that was used, or like-minded countries. And this has given birth to the Mineral Security Partnership. And the third prize is then to kind of extend your, your sphere of influence to another group of countries that are perhaps not aligned but neutral and support some build out of value chains there because any part of the value chain that gets built out that isn't where it's currently concentrated is actually good for the resilience. So hence that brings me back to my first point today, which is around the geopolitics and why there's so much interest from so many sovereign states. But uh, those are some of the high-level trends that I'm, that I'm seeing. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Martin, for your, those insights. Franklin, when it comes to investment risks, such as political instability or infrastructure gaps, what approaches do you see as effective in creating a secure and predictable investment environment? Um, I think, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think um, for us at the AFC, we, especially the critical minerals, I remember when we started looking at this four or five years ago, and when you map out where all the deposits are, especially in terms of large reserves that can stay very competitive on a global scale, they were naughty and not so easy countries. Um, you can't choose where the deposits are. In addition to where their location is from a geopolitical perspective, literally almost all of them had no infrastructure. So you had two macro risks you were already dealing with. For AFC, uh, roughly 45 plus countries in Africa are member countries of the AFC, which makes it easier for us to a certain extent to manage our stakeholders when we're going into projects. Um, you, even if you're not a non-member country or if you don't have a country um, as part of your institution, I think, for example, in, with the commercial banks, there are things that you call present countries. So basically they have a banking branch or a license mm -hmm. in that country because they can also manage their stakeholders, etc. cetera. Um, it's something similar with AFC, even though we don't have the, the branches, but it's to manage the stakeholders um, as importantly. But the point um, we're trying to make here as well is if you look at all the issues uh, pertaining to critical minerals, sustainability, value addition, geopolitics, mm -hmm. The, th the theme keeps repeating itself. And, I mean, there's a reason why, because if you observe the bauxite industry and the iron ore industry dominating in West Africa, once the commodity prices collapse, the producers go bankrupt. 
And then you have to wait for the cycle to restart all over again, and then you come out of care and maintenance. Mm -hmm. The only way to continue to operate on a sustainable basis to deal with those kind of cycles is to also go down midstream and downstream. That way you can spoon in the effect. Um, I think we're in South Africa, uh, manganese, is, the prices just collapse, so you're still having the same issue. But if you start to beneficiate and add value in the country, in the, on the continent, you'll be able to manage some of those. And that also ties in with the geopolitical risk because a lot of the balance sheets of the governments are stretched. They need those tax revenues, royalties, the tax revenues, the duties from those mines to continue to sustain the state. The moment you are struggling because of um, you know, difficult commodity markets, they start to look for who is more financially capable to keep the operations going, and then that's what leads to license conversations. So in order to smooth in that and to continue to manage this on a long-term basis, literally what we've told all our potential clients in the critical mineral space is your projects have to have the midstream and downstream. It's not just, you don't just do a DFS anymore um, for a concentrate. What is your plan to start to beneficiate five, six, seven years from now? Yes, the technology might be difficult to get because the East has a far um, a head start, but you have to start thinking about now. I mean, no one does a gold project today to produce concentrates. It's all about getting to the dory before you get to the refinery. So it's the same with critical minerals or any other um, minerals and metals and mining spaces for you to operate in a long-term sustainable manner in order to manage all the geopolitics. You have to have a midstream and a downstream approach in your development um, strategy. With respect to um, um, the infrastructure bit, um, which I talked about, uh, we have to just, it's part of the, I mean, it's just taken as part of the project. And there are several financial institutions, including the AFC, that do focus on doing infrastructure tranches to support projects of that nature. Thank you. So infrastructure, definitely a big problem. Um, in terms of taxation and the fair value distribution when implementing policies, how will we make sure that's fairly managed between local and international investors? Oh, that's for me? <laughs> okay. Well, the, the good thing is there are quite a lot of templates and the um, the ministries are also having a deep thought about this, right? Um, yeah. In terms of the ministries that we engage with, when you put together your royalties, your community development fund, your taxes, share the dividends, etc., it's all about okay, how do you rank against your neighbors? How do you rank against the rest of the continent? And um, a lot of the um, engagements with them is, I mean, they are actually looking at this. So if you're operating in Ghana, how is Sierra Leone taxing and how the communities are sharing all the benefits of the project? They would also look at what Mali is doing, what Burkina is doing, and what Central Africa is doing. Is doing. So there's quite a bit of templates uh, there. And it's only fair to get to a fair distribution because um, I always um, talk to, when we talk to some of our portfolio companies, we focus a lot on that. And the reason for that is it's Africa, it's geopolitics. If there's any regime, regime change, democratic or not democratic, that's the first place to go look for money is where contracts look to be sim unfair. Yeah. Not necessarily everyone was there when you negotiated. Yes, we agree. But you have to compare with what the next best person is doing. And that's exactly their mindsets of any new government that will come in. Um, is basically how you're doing that. And at the same time, we've also made it very clear um, in terms of incorporating local content policies and in our investment agreements, in terms of yes. how are you transitioning. We, we know we don't have the expertise, but once the operations are done, how are you transitioning the senior management roles, et cetera, to people from the country? Um, that also helps to mitigate any potential um, concerns. Thank you. That leads into my next question, which is open for the panel. One of the biggest challenges is balancing local content policies with the interests of international investors. How do you see this balance being struck effectively in African countries? Jude, I don't know if you want to... Uh, um, 
I'm happy to discuss this because um, I've been very present in a number of countries where they are trying to strike that balance. Um, when I lived in South Africa, actually, uh, they were then beginning to think about, you know, this uh, black empowerment um, imperative and how to make sure that it doesn't, you know, keep investors out, uh, while at the same time also addressing some very real issues that needed to be addressed with regards to um, local capacity. Same in, you know, another country where I've done a, quite a bit of work is, um, well, throughout West Africa, but Equatorial Guinea in particular, we had a, a discussion about this this morning. Um, listen, the truth of the matter is it's not that difficult to strike a balance. Um, there is such huge demand, and I don't mean to throw the oil companies under the bus or, uh, or, or the mining companies under the bus, but the demand from their standpoint of being in those countries is great. Uh, so they have some elasticity in terms of what they're willing to 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 give uh, towards this uh, towards this initiative. Likewise, though, the governments also have a very strong demand for those investments. So they also are quite elastic in in regards to making sure that whereas they address the issue over time, they don't in one fell swoop. Um, intend to change the dynamics of sort of local capacity in one month or one year. So I find that um, there's actually very good accommodation uh, in the countries uh, where, where I've been active uh, and local content uh, is its own reward, candidly. Uh, there are some countries that have done it phenomenally. Nigeria is one of them. Nigeria may be leading this continent in terms of the importance and strength of local continent, but other countries are, are, are following behind. And it can't be something uh, that can be abandoned because it's not just, you know, do-gooder type of uh, uh, approach. It also is sustainable. You're only sustainable in the long run if the local community has the capacity uh, to assist, to partner with the investors. So it's something that I stress very much, something that I get involved in uh, as an advisor. Uh, to governments quite a bit. Thank you, Mametsa. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this, and I had a conversation earlier, and uh, someone was uh, giving a tough time about black economic empowerment in South Africa. Um, firstly, I think that, you know, when it comes to community and, and employees, and, you know, I was talking to some of the guys uh, at Anglo about this and how that has changed um, the status quo. I would not be sitting here if it wasn't for some of those rules. I was sponsored by Anglo-American. And through that and all the other initiatives, I then was able to actually, you know, do what I've done now. And I think that, you know, we wouldn't have changed the diversity of, you know, uh, countries who owns the minerals, right? But I think that what we shouldn't forget when we're doing all of this, I mean, if you look at it, Norway, Norway has rules around national, nationalism, but it hasn't been, it's, it's not criticized. So I wonder why sometimes when African countries do it and it's right for their countries, it is criticized. What I think is important is ensuring that one, the rules are well understood so that the incoming investors and potential companies that are actually going to work in that, in, in coming into that country understand the rules, can make the decision, right? If, if I'm looking for cobalt and I need to go to DRC, I'm going to abide. And I'll tell you when, when, you know, when I started Moshe Capital, you know, most of the work we were going to do was, was going to be in South Africa. And as I was talking to a lot of investors, U.S. investors, U.K., um, I remember at the time people did not want to invest here, but they would invest in, in Zimbabwe. And I would ask them, you know, with all the new rules that are coming out of Zimbabwe, Guess what? The, the projects that we're looking at in Zimbabwe made sense even with those rules and they were willing to actually put their money. So I think the local con content must be there and countries must actually be firm on what they want to do. Uh, but it must be within reason that it does not make them globally not competitive, right? Stick to the rules, point number two. And point number three Ensure that you actually find the right solutions around funding these things. So if, if you're going to ask for local content, it does not necessarily mean that you always have to actually give a free ride to the, to the, 
um, you know, to the investors, well, local investors that you're going to give the shareholding to. No, you can actually find other structures. We have probably 10 structures that we put in place when we help people with their BEE, and it, it actually has been successful. So you, you, you should, you need to, it is possible to strike that balance and have a win-win so- solution. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add? No, I can maybe just say from a financial institution point of view, I mean, um, we believe local content is important for many of the African countries and the projects we finance. Um, what we've definitely seen, though, depending on the type of project that happens in the country, the skills development must happen first. So, you know, having a percentage local content is one thing, but in many instances, it becomes a phased in project for, you know, ownership versus skills development, etc. Because like you said, you want to make sure that the project is still successful and that over time, you know, our, our local um, Africans can actually take over the roles and the jobs, etc. as well. So there's definitely a, a, a space for development of skills, um, ownership definitely as well, but it becomes, and what we've seen, there's a change. It becomes active ownership, which is very important as well because that's got its own benefits, you know, within the local content scenario. So... Um, and, and that's what we also like to see when we finance project, because then it means there's buy-in from the countries, buy-in from staff, buy-in from whoever is part of that project. And, and for us, we've seen many success stories. I think in South Africa specifically, our renewable programs is very important. And still, we would like to see the critical minerals becoming that as well, where it's where it's not just ownership percentage-wise, but involvement, development, and I think we all mentioned the whole beneficiation part, even if it's not 100%. Thank you. Jude? Can I just quickly add on to what uh, Shirley was saying? And, and she's exactly right. Um, they go hand in hand. Uh, local content and skills development are inherently um, part of each other. Even me as a lawyer, um, you know, putting on my lawyer hat, uh, I'm famous for going into meetings, particularly with uh, sovereigns, and essentially saying, um, as a part of my pitch, I'm here to make myself redundant. I'm here to do work on your behalf, but I will come in, whether you require it of me or not, to make sure I have a local partner, and over time, to make sure that that o- local partner understands all of the substantive things that I know, mm-hmm. so that maybe in the future, you reach right around the corner to get your expert lawyer as opposed to reaching to Washington, D.C. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's really the point in the, in the long run, is to create all of this capacity in all these countries uh, that have the need. Great, thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, on to the next discussion question. Collaboration is essential in the critical mineral sector. How can partnerships between governments, private companies, and international stakeholders contribute to long-term project project sustainability. Franklin, I don't know if you want to kick us off. Yeah, um, actually, the the part that I wanted to touch on was um, regional partnerships. I think for, if I look at the mine development cycle, there's a very strong role, especially South Africa, can play for the region. You've got DRA here, you've got VBCOM, I think you have all the technical expertise in South Africa. But because of the fine, lack of financing, I think a special product should be designed. I mean, it's sort of like an ECA type box facility, but it's not being rolled out as one would expect. Mm-hmm. We have an intention to build a mine every year at the AFC, whether it's in the precious bulk critical mineral space. And a lot of projects in the precious and bulk space is being executed by companies like DRA, et cetera, out of South Africa. But we're not seeing the financial institutions um, coming out there. So we need to be very deliberate about that partnership, um, especially in the greenfield space if we want to solve this uh, particular issue with respect to critical minerals because I know the technical expertise is still being 
developed, but there are roles that the big FIs in South Africa can play that will magnificently change the trajectory of the sector in, in, in Africa. And for us, that's where we are looking for basically like our own African mineral security partnership from a financing perspective or sort of Africa security minerals finance network from an African perspective of how do we bring the capital and the technical expertise together for African projects because I mean, you've been mining for more than a hundred years in South Africa, same in Central Africa, and we don't have a lot of those expertise in the West. So there's quite a lot we can do from a technical and financial partnership perspective that um, needs to be rolled out as quickly as possible. Definitely. Thank yeah. you. Martin, do you have anything? Well, maybe just, to yeah, just to add, I, I think, you know, when we're talking about some of these, the, the value addition and some of the value chains and some of these products are extremely complex. There's been a lot of talk about EV batteries, or even just you know lithium-ion batteries, or behind the grid, or behind sort of the meter or grid stabilization batteries. Now, no country can do that on their own. Uh, first of all, they don't. No single country in this region has all the minerals. Okay, so if you if you don't have some kind of collaboration or trade with somebody, you stopped right there. Then. I am very much supportive of every country trying to add as much value within their, their borders as they can. And I think we should try and support them and, and even get them a bit further than what they can do right now. So something that's in within reach, but the, it's not happening. But every country has its limits. And as a result, there are some countries in the region with higher you know, uh, sophistication, let's say, or ability to take on complex tasks and the talent pool sit there, et cetera. So there needs to be some kind of regional collaboration around you know, building out these value chains. Uh, at the same time, everybody wants to do it on their own and they feel like if some value addition happens outside their borders that they're giving something up so as a panel discussed yesterday, I think we need to find out a fair way so that the region can share in that. Now, the states play one role in this, but we all know that a value chain's really going to be built out by the private sector. They're the ones that are going to make the capital available. They're going to bring the skills and the talent in initially and transfer it. So this has to be much more than just government collaboration and intercoordination, there has to be a mechanism there where the where you know we're taking a look at the private sector and being able to mobilize that. Again, just like mining, these value chains, I mean we're playing in a globally competitive market. You have a choice to build a gigafactory in Texas or you have a choice to build one here. I think we have to recognize that and there's only so many of those very, very highly specialized engineers on the planet at the moment. You know, I, I understood Musk had to import like 80 from South Korea to get, get his gigafactory going. So these are real constraints. I think we have to keep this all in mind, but we're certainly not going to achieve it without, without partnerships. Thank you. Shirley? I can maybe just add as well. We've said it, and I think this is the second time that it's mentioned, the regional beneficiation hubs that we should do. If I just look at our copper deposits on the continent, and it's all Zambia, DRC, even Botswana, et cetera, what they have. You know, some countries are a bit ahead of the others, but to have beneficiation happening, um, you know, to whatever extent in many of these regions, I think, um, <laughs> and you've said it nicely, but I think our African countries must get over themselves and make sure that they actually work together because that's how it, growth will actually increase of many of in, within the boundaries of many of those countries. And I think, um, Franklin, you've mentioned it as well. I think the, the financial institutions, the local in-country financial institutions, the DFIs, um, so should actually work together a lot more with, with some of the more specialized financial institutions. If I look at what we do, we do resources and energy specifically, so it becomes uh, nicely specialized. Um, but we should use our DFIs as well as, you know, our ECAs as well as our 
local banks um, a lot more because we want to grow Africa, so there's, there's a lot of expertise in many areas sitting within Africa, so we should use that as well. Um, we have everything that it takes. It's just that working together, pri private, public partnerships. We've seen it nicely happening in South Africa on the renewable side, and we need to build that out as well. Um, and if our critical minerals in all of Africa is going to help with the just transition, we can't just ship it out and bring it back again because we need solar um, panels, for example. So <laughs> I think that's very important to remember. Now, I just wanted to add that, you know, um, on the skills, um, you know, I feel like we, we actually need to have a bigger plan for ourselves you know, when China decided that they want to be the best in high-speed trains, nobody stopped them. So we need to actually figure out what is important for us and have the partnerships with the leaders in those industries. What makes Elon Musk not want to come here, you know, come back home? I mean, <laughs> challenge right there, you know, and uh, set up an electric vehicles uh, business here. Why not? So I think we need to actually also plan for ourselves and then find the solutions around what we want to achieve. I am with Shelley, beneficiation, and especially critical minerals are giving us a platform to actually level the ground for ourselves. So, you know, beneficiation, local beneficiation should be one of the key things that we actually ask for, uh, for ourselves. If you have one project only that you're focusing on or one commodity, we have to make sure that it's a good enough all body that the beneficiation, if you're putting up a plant, a smelter, a refiner, whatever next to it, that it actually makes sense? Or is it better that it yeah. gets, you know, exported, you know, to, to wherever it's needed? But for me, the important part is, is a diverse portfolio. If you have a diverse portfolio, cycles and commodity, cyclicality, all of that can be managed within a wider diverse portfolio. And I know not everyone has the opportunity to do that. But if you can build a diverse portfolio, it is better in the long run because we know what happens to commodities and cycles. So um, technology, the mining project, the efficiency of putting up beneficiation, all of that's what we look at as well. And ultimately, financing things like that, we are using you know, Banking 101. We are using your money to finance products so that you can get a return on your deposit, deposits or you being a shareholder. So that becomes for us a very fine balance, what we need to manage as well, because we signed up to be responsible bankers, um, yes. you know, and we've done that commitment, and hence us looking at projects very critically. Thank you, everyone, for attending the panel, to attending the panel and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.